Hey, what's up you lot, Path here. And in today's video, we are going to be discussing the basics of Einstein's field equations. As always, you don't need to know any advanced mathematics for this. Hopefully we'll be understanding these terms in a fairly intuitive way. If you enjoyed this video, then please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content. Hit the bell button too, to be notified whenever I upload and check out my Patreon as well if you'd like to support me on there. Okay, let's get into it. The first thing that we need to understand is that the Einstein field equations are essentially the governing equations in the theory of general relativity. They're basically the big boy equations that relate some of the most important concepts in the theory of GR. Now, notice how I keep saying equations rather than equation. Well, that's because what we see here is a rather convenient way of writing multiple equations. These little subscripts, mu and nu, can take different numerical values. And for each value of mu and nu, we have a particular equation. Now we'll understand the specifics of mu and nu as well as the exact values that they can take very shortly. But basically this way of writing Einstein's field equations is just a convenient way of writing multiple equations. Now, before we take a detailed look at what each one of these terms actually means, another thing that we need to know is that these equations are dealing with tensors. G subscript mu nu is a tensor. Lowercase g subscript mu nu is a tensor and t subscript mu nu is a tensor as well. Tensors are really interesting mathematical objects, and we're not gonna go too deeply into them in this video. Instead, for our purposes, we will be treating them simply as matrices. Now, for those of you that are familiar with matrices, you can skip to this timestamp here if you don't wanna be bored by my rather basic description of them. But if you're not familiar with matrices, stick around. Now, matrices basically look something like this. They essentially contain lots of little bits of information with each bit of information referring to something very specific. Unlike this explanation, I guess. So let's take an example. We could create a matrix for the following scenario. Let's say we've got five bags of apples. Each bag contains three apples, one red, one yellow, and one green. We label each bag with a number, one, two, three, four, and five. And within each bag, we label the apples as well. All the red apples are called apple number one, the yellows are apple number two, and the greens are apple number three. We then find the masses of each of those apples. Here's a table showing those masses. We can actually represent all of this information in a matrix. This is what that looks like. Notice that each row refers to a specific bag, bag one, bag two, bag three, bag four, or bag five, and each column refers to a specific number of apple, or in this case, specific color of apple. And we can call this matrix M, since it contains all the information about the masses of these apples. Well, speaking generally, we can represent a matrix like this using just the matrix elements. Each little piece of information in this matrix is known as a matrix element. And if we had a generic matrix M, we could represent it like this. The element in the very top left position can be represented by M subscript one one, because it's the element of matrix M that's found in row one, column one basically referring to the bag labeled number one and the apple labeled number one in that bag. We could also look at element M12, which refers to the first bag, second apple, or first row, second column, and so on and so forth. The first number in the subscript refers to which row in our matrix we're looking at, and the second number refers to which column. And if we want to talk about a generic matrix element, one of the matrix elements in this matrix, we could call it M subscript alpha beta, where alpha can take the values from one to five, representing bags one to five or rows one to five, and beta can be between one and three. So apples one to three or columns one to three. And so we see that matrices are basically just an interesting way of displaying information, but they also have some very interesting mathematical properties when we start playing around with them. In fact, the tensors in Einstein's field equations behave in a very similar way. We can represent these tensors with matrices. You can see that we're referring to specific matrix elements row mu, column nu. Which by the way is also a really good way to see that these are referring to multiple equations. Let's say we've got mu is equal to one and nu is equal to one. Well then that's one equation. Another possible combination is mu is equal to one and nu is equal to two, or any other possible combination of mu and nu. Now interestingly, the tensors referred to in Einstein's field equations are represented by four by four matrices, which means four rows and four columns. Now rather annoyingly, but slightly usefully as well. There's a convention that gets used where we label the rows and columns as rows zero, one, two, and three, and columns zero, one, two, and three, rather than one, two, three, and four. So we've got the zeroth row, first row, second row, and third row, and similarly, we've got the zeroth column, first column, second column, and third column. 
In other words, our subscripts mu and nu can take the values of 0, 1, 2, and 3. Again, like I said, for our purposes, this is mathematical convention, but it actually plays really nicely into some relativistic ideas. Specifically, the subscripts 0, 1, 2, and 3 refer to the four different dimensions used in the theories of relativity. 0 refers to the time dimension, and 1, 2, and 3 refer to the spatial dimensions, which we can call x, y, and z. I'm paraphrasing, of course, things are a little bit more complicated, but for now, that's all we care about. So now that we know that we're dealing with tensors represented by matrices, specifically 4 by 4 matrices, let's work out what each one of these tensors is actually representing. What does it mean? The first tensor we'll be looking at is T subscript mu nu. It's known as the stress energy tensor. Essentially, it contains information about the distribution of stuff in the region of space-time that we happen to be considering. Stuff meaning mass and energy. Many of you might be familiar with the idea that mass and energy are equivalent, exchangeable, if you will. According to Einstein's famous equation, E is equal to mc squared, though of course this is a slightly simplified version of that equation, but it still conveys the same idea. And the stress energy tensor essentially contains information about how this matter and energy is distributed throughout the region of space-time that we happen to be thinking about. In many cases, it's actually the whole universe, but that's cool too. For example, there's a term that looks at the energy density in that region, how energy is distributed over a certain volume, as well as momentum density terms, and shear stress terms, and pressure terms, which all sound rather complicated, but essentially just the distribution of stuff and energy and how it moves around and how it is existing in the region of space-time that we happen to be considering. I realize that it's quite a vague explanation, but I think to do it justice, I'd have to make a separate video on these tensors. All of these terms, mass distribution, energy distribution, momentum flux, and so on and so forth, are contained within the stress energy tensor. And they're really important because they contribute directly to the warping of space-time. You may have seen a common description of general relativity that goes along the lines of a massive object, say the sun, for example, being placed into the fabric of space-time and how that massive object bends the fabric of space-time around it. That's because it has mass, or it has energy, or it has momentum, or it has some sort of pressure going on. That's what directly causes the warping of space-time. And this, in fact, brings us to the other side of the equation. If T mu nu, the stress energy tensor, contains information about how stuff is distributed throughout space-time, the tensor capital G mu nu, known as the Einstein tensor, contains information about the curvature of that space-time fabric. In other words, a very basic description of our Einstein field equations is that they basically tell us how the distribution of stuff in space-time ends up warping that space-time, and equivalently, how the warped space-time causes the stuff inside it to behave. And our Einstein field equations tell us exactly how that happens. How much energy or how much mass do you need in order to warp space-time in a particular way? And consequently, how objects behave in that warped space-time. Now, capital G mu nu, the Einstein tensor, is a rather complicated function of a few other tensors, such as the Ricci tensor. We won't look into that in too much detail here, but basically it tells us something about how different the space-time is to flat space-time. And it's a function of the metric tensor, lowercase g mu nu, which, by the way, we can also see in this term here. It's a very important tensor in relativity. The metric tensor is effectively a measure of the shape of space-time, as opposed to the curvature, which is more measured by the uppercase g mu nu Einstein tensor. The metric tensor deserves some explanation. And again, it's a tricky concept to cover in a video that's not about the metric tensor, but let's think about it like this. Let's imagine an ant can live on a two-dimensional surface, a flat plane. It can move forward and backward or left and right, but it's not allowed to move up or down. Now we label two points on this flat surface, points A and B. The ant is at A and it wants to get to B. The shortest route to get from A to B is simply a straight line. This is a rather simplified description of flat space-time, where there's no energy, no matter, no nothing, to warp the space-time fabric around itself. But let's say that the surface that the ant is now sitting on is somehow warped, so that it's on the outside of a sphere. The surface is now curved. But the ant still follows the same rules. It can move in what it thinks is the forward and backward direction, or the right and left direction, or of course, any combination of those two directions. It cannot jump up off the surface or burrow down into the surface. So, when getting from point A to B, what's the shortest route? It's now a curved path. In this example, if the ant wanted to burrow down into the surface in order to get from A to B quicker, that's kind of the equivalent of us traveling through a wormhole in our space-time fabric. 
But anyway, the important thing, the metric tensor, just tells us the shape of essentially the surface the end happens to be sitting on. It tells us if it's a flat surface or a curved surface, and it tells us exactly what shape the surface basically has. Except in our case, there's obviously a few more dimensions to be accounting for. Now, if capital G mu nu, the Einstein tensor which deals with the curvature of space-time, is dependent on the shape of space-time as we would expect, then why is there a separate term in the Einstein field equations with g mu nu in it? Well, this is because it accounts for another phenomenon entirely. This weird little constant here, this lambda, is known as the cosmological constant. And we could go on and on and on about it. Currently, in our mathematics, it accounts for the fact that our universe is expanding at a faster and faster rate. We've observed galaxies really, really far away from us moving away from us faster than galaxies that are slightly nearer to us. We've got lots of evidence that currently suggests that the universe is not only expanding, getting bigger, space-time is stretching, but it seems to be stretching faster and faster. This is not really the warping of space-time due to the existence of mass or energy within that space-time. This is something else entirely. This is inherent to the space-time. So for this reason, we currently think the cosmological constant has a positive value, which suggests an expanding universe. This constant has a rather strange history. Initially, Einstein published his equations without the cosmological constant term, and then he chucked it in. Then he felt like it was his biggest blunder, and then realized that actually it does need to be there based on experimental observable evidence. Again, this deserves a video of its own, and I'd like to make that soon, so keep an eye out for that. How could I pass up the opportunity to talk about something that Einstein himself described as his own biggest blunder? Now, these other constants you may be familiar with. Eight, hopefully you're familiar with, as well as pi and g, which is the universal gravitational constant, and c, which is the speed of light. These constants basically tell us exactly how much mass or how much energy or how much whatever in the stress energy tensor is needed in order to create a particular warping of space-time. They can be thought of as the coupling constants. They essentially tell us how strong the effect mass or energy has on the warping of space-time. If this constant was bigger, then we would see more warping of space-time for the same amount of mass. If this constant was smaller, we'd see less warping. But in our universe, the constant seems to be 8 pi g over c to the power of 4. So anyway, we've basically looked at a simple description of Einstein's field equations and what information they convey. They essentially relate the shape and curvature of space-time to the distribution of mass and energy within it. Therefore, they tell us exactly how mass or energy causes space-time to warp, and consequently how this warping results in mass and energy behaving in that warped space-time. It also accounts for the fact that the expansion of our universe seems to be accelerating, using the lambda or cosmological constant term. I haven't really shown you exactly how each one of these tensors relates to the physical ideas that we've discussed, but again, future video. One thing I will say though is that finding solutions to these Einstein field equations is very, very difficult, but we have found some. One of them is a flat space-time, which tells us that a region of space-time without any mass or any energy exists as flat space-time just as we'd expect, no warping, no nothing. Another solution to these Einstein field equations is given by the Schwarzschild metric, which describes stationary black holes, and it describes how space-time warps around these stationary black holes. I've actually made two videos on stationary black holes, check out my black holes playlist, as well as one on the Kerr solution, or the Kerr metric, which talks about rotating black holes. So please do check out those videos, and in the meantime I'd like to thank you so much for all your support, and thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please do leave a thumbs up, and subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content. Hit that bell button if you want to be notified when I upload, and please do check out my Patreon if you'd like to support me on there. Once again, thanks so much for watching, and I will see you really soon.